Telepathy and Human Personality, the 10th Frederick W. H. Myers Memorial Lecture, 1950, by J. B. Ryan, read by Felix Warren. Printed by the Society for Psychical Research, price one shilling, six dollars net. The Society for Psychical Research is located in London, 31 Tavistock Square, WC1. The purpose of the Society for Psychical Research, which was founded in 1882, is to examine without prejudice or prepossession, and in a scientific spirit, those faculties of man, real or supposed, which appear to be inexplicable on any generally recognized hypothesis. The Society does not hold or express corporate views. Any opinions expressed in its publications are, therefore, those of the authors alone. First published, 1951. Printed in Great Britain by Robert McLehos and Co. Limited, The University Press, Glasgow. Introduction by S.G. Soule. Frederick Myers, in whose honor this lecture was founded, combined the gifts of a poet and classical scholar with a genuine passion for scientific inquiry and speculative thought. Though he was not a biologist, he yet made himself conversant with the biological and psychological knowledge of his day that he might be the better equipped to elaborate his profoundly original conception of the subliminal mind. One cannot help wondering how, had he been alive today, his essentially synthetic mind would have reacted to the present analytical trend of psychical research. What would he have thought of the card-guessing and picture-guessing experiments that figure so prominently in modern research? I think he would have recognized the value of these methods and the impression they make on ordinary scientific opinion, but he would have been quick to realize that by their very nature they cannot take us much beyond the threshold of the subject. Card-guessing, he probably would have said, is too crude and feeble an instrument to throw much light on the telepathic process itself, and I think he would have been right. Myers would have urged that we try to develop methods for reproducing experimentally the essential features of the spontaneous cases. However this may be, I feel sure that Frederick Myers would have welcomed an investigator as single-minded, as enthusiastic, and as tenacious as Dr. Joseph Banks Rhine, and that they would have found very much in common in spite of their different methods of approach. Dr. Ryan holds the unique distinction of being the head of what is probably the only university department in existence, devoted to the sole purpose of studying the very difficult and exasperating subject of extrasensory perception and allied phenomena. In the parapsychology laboratory at Duke University, North Carolina, he, was, he has working with him a number of young men and women who spend their whole time thinking about and experimenting on those curious powers of the human mind which are so strangely neglected and ignored by orthodox psychology. Why does official science neglect these phenomena? Mainly, I think, because of their elusive and intangible nature. Science asks for results that it can repeat and examine at its leisure. Take the dice-throwing experiments in which it is claimed that a man's mind can influence the fall of a die. Here, at any rate, one might have expected something that could have been examined objectively by a means of appropriate physical instruments. But not a bit of it. Psychokinesis appears to be as elusive as telepathy or clairvoyance. Apparently, it can only be demonstrated as a mere statistical effect. I see no prospects at present that any English university is likely to follow the example of Duke, unless, of course, some benefactor left a large sum of money for the express purpose. The general attitude of university authorities in this country is that extrasensory perception is in too embryonic a stage to justify the large expenditure which would be involved in organizing a department of psychical research. The returns, it is felt, would be too uncertain. There is some justification, I think, for this point of view since, though scientific methods are used in the study of telepathy, it is not yet in any real sense a fully-fledged science. We must not, however, be too discouraged by this conservative attitude, for there are signs that science is beginning to take notice of our researches. The old intolerance is fast disappearing. Last January, over 400 members of the Society for Experimental Biology attended a symposium at Queen Mary College on paranormal phenomena. It was almost an historic occasion, and so far as I could judge, the attitude of the meeting was entirely sympathetic. 
Another meeting was devoted to a discussion of precognition by the Society for Visiting Scientists. Here again, there seems to be no hostility to the revolutionary idea of foreseeing the future in certain cases. If I were asked to say what I thought was the most important contribution made by Dr. Rhine to the progress of our subject, I should not say, as some have done, that he, has the, he was the first to use statistical methods. Investigators like Coover were carrying out statistical experiments in telepathy as far back as the First World War. Miss Jefferson in England was doing statistical experiments in clairvoyance in 1926 before Dr. Ryan came on the scene. But nearly all these pioneers used for their experiments either playing cards or numbers. I always think that Dr. Ryan's great innovation was that he abandoned the use of playing cards and employed instead cards bearing only five types of simple geometric symbols. Recent experiments with one subject have shown that the use of cards with only five symbols leads to a degree of success four times as great as that obtained with playing cards. Dr. Ryan's experiments in clairvoyance and psychokinesis are of course well known, but it is not so generally known that he was the first to carry out systematic and successful experiments in the difficult subject of precognition. Dr. Ryan devised extremely ingenious methods for excluding the possibility that his subjects might be accounted for by the operation of telepathy and clairvoyance acting in the present. With characteristic modesty, he does not claim, however, to have established precognition beyond Cavill. Dr. Ryan's work has made itself in most civilized countries, and it has even penetrated the Iron Curtain. Quite recently, it was reported that the Soviet Union had accused him of administering telepathic dope to the toiling millions and teaching things like telepathy, which cannot be true. It would appear then that, like certain other better established biological laws, extrasensory perception ceases to operate at the Iron Curtain. However this may be, it is certain that systems of society based upon a crude materialism can have no possible use for ESP, at least present day ESP. And this brings me to the outstanding importance of the work of men like Dr. Ryan. Today, a devastating materialism is creeping like a blight over large portions of the globe. Concentrating as it does on only the sensory aspects of human existence with a complete negation of all spiritual values, this system of thought will, if not counteracted, end by destroying what is best in human life and may forge such shackles for the spirit of man as it will not throw off for a thousand years. Never at any time in history have we more urgent need of an answer to the question, what is man's place in the cosmos? Is he a brief candle that glimmers for a moment and then is lost in an alien and unsympathetic darknesses of time and space? Or is he an immaterial being who, when he puts off this muddy vesture of decay, continues to live and feel and share in a freer and finer consciousness? Is consciousness a mere byproduct of the brain, or is the brain a canalizer and inhibitor of the free flow of consciousness as Bergson thought? The souls of Keats would fly on the wings of poesy, though the dull brain perplexes and retards. The supreme importance, as I see it, of the labors of Dr. Ryan and his fellow parapsychologists lies in this, that they are providing a slow, painful, but sure demonstration by the methods of science of a truth that the religions of the world have grasped intuitively or that is seen only vaguely through the eyes of faith. I mean in the truth that man is more like a physical organism responding to stimuli and is more than a physical organism responding to stimuli, that while living in this world, he is yet in contact with an extrasensory order of existence whose relations to time and space transcend those of the world of matter. Of all studies pursued by man, I believe that parapsychology is the most likely to provide an answer to the questions with which, as Mr. Belloc once said, human beings ought to be most vitally occupied, the pursuit of happiness and the immortality of the soul. The world will not listen to the voice of religion nor to the clear voice of Wordsworth calling across a century defaced by the two most hideous wars of history, but it pays lip service to the voice of science. Let us hope it will listen to what the science of parapsychology has to say before it is too late. Extrasensory perception is a spark now that may one day become a blaze by whose light the darkness of our human destiny may be illumined. Telepathy and Human Personality The range of problems that interested the founders of the Society for Psychical Research furnished a basis for the definition of the branch of inquiry which they initiated. 
They devoted their attention to phenomena that promised to throw some light on the relation of human personality to matter in general and to the material body in particular. Their studies were approaches, by way of science, to the general question of man's place in nature, often formulated as the mind-body problem, and previously dealt with only by the methods of philosophy and religion. They made of this area of study a science, a branch of psychology that deals with whatever in personality lies beyond physical explanation, a branch that was now neglected until they began systematic work on it. That is now called the science of parapsychology. Their special attention was accordingly drawn to occurrences suggesting to them that man has powers that transcend his material properties, more particularly to cases of spontaneous telepathy, and these led eventually to experimental research in telepathy. Viewed as direct mind-to-mind -mind communication, transcending physical barriers and limitations, Telepathy appeared to confirm the presence of non-physical or spiritual qualities in human personality, and therefore to refute the otherwise unrefuted claims of materialism. They came to recognize that even more conclusively the establishment of the spirit survival of bodily death would confirm the view of the spiritual nature of man as opposed to a physicalistic view. Quite naturally, therefore, the branch of the physical research field psychical research field, which attempts to deal with the survival question, that is, the study of mediumship, eventually took precedence over all the other work. It, is, it promised the most ready answer to the leading question with which these early Psi explorers were concerned. There were, of course, other types of unexplainable human experiences that we call psychic, but these aroused a less compelling order of interest. There were large percentages of these cases that appeared to involve clairvoyance, precognition, or foreknowledge, and even some that told of physical phenomena of unknown agency, unknown agency. Dealing more closely with the material world as they did, however, such phenomena seemed less suggestive of transcendent and spiritual powers than did experiences of telepathy, and they raised questions that could more easily be passed over in favor of a prior consideration of telepathy and spirit survival. As we look back today over nearly 70 years of research which these pioneers predecessors initiated we have the natural advantage of retrospect and we can learn some useful lessons from this section of history if we will we can take note of the viewpoint with which they set out on their research program said to what extent it was limited by the cultural pattern of the time and observe the effect of such limitation upon the succeeding developments of experimental work we may hope thus to learn how to approach the problems of this field today in a safer manner than we otherwise could, a manner that is better able to protect us from the philosophical bias from which we may suffer. We can do this while fully appreciating the great contribution made by the founders and the courage with which they undertook their difficult and unpopular task. The early explorers who initiated our science would, we have no doubt, long ago have made and profited from these retrospective observations if given our opportunity. We are not, then, lacking in respect in trying to improve upon their work and outlook. Rather, we dishonor their purpose if we fail to do so. The story of the research in telepathy has great lessons for us today. Divined as Myers defined it, the communication of impressions of any kind from one mind to another independently of the recognized channels of sense, telepathy became a dated concept. For one thing, it thus became identified with a cultural stage when it was customary in psychological circles to believe that we think it with a distinct part of us known as our minds and distinguishable from our brains. Whether or not this theory is true, such a view was not, and is still not, scientifically established. Rather, it was a derivative of the religious philosophy of the past, a philosophy that was, of course, oriented toward a spiritual conception of man. The point to note especially is that there crept into the definition of telepathy an assumption of the very concept of human personality, which the demonstration of telepathy was designed to establish. Once we recognize this original philosophical setting, we can better understand the difference in attitude, for example, toward cases of spontaneous telepathy and spontaneous clairvoyance, although spontaneous experiences of clairvoyance and precognition were probably as common as those identified as involving telepathy. The telepathic cases were studied to the exclusion and neglect of the others. This discrimination carried over into the experimental studies as well. 
outside France, which had, of course, a distinctly different philosophical leaning, there was little attention paid to the phenomenon of clairvoyance. In the experimental work of the society, there was practically nothing done on clairvoyance until Miss Jefferson's work in the 20s of the present century. Apparently, no one was interested in the question of whether or not clairvoyance occurred, so strong was the force of cultural inertia in such matters. Indeed, this predilection for telepathy was so determinative that, when experiments in telepathy were undertaken, no provision was considered necessary to exclude the possibility of clairvoyance and precognition. The results which were interpreted as due to telepathy could all have been produced quite as well by means of clairvoyance itself. The tests were all of the same basic type. A sender was instructed to concentrate his attention on a target object by looking at it and thinking of it while a second subject or receiver attempted to identify the object of which he was thinking. Both clairvoyance of the object and telepathic cognition of the subject's thought were presumable possibilities. This was the standard type of test in the original experimental work of the founders of the society. Not only was that the case, it became the standard procedure everywhere telepathy tests were conducted, and so it continued for nearly 50 years. Even when the problem with telepathy invaded the psychology laboratories of the universities, the tradition of ignoring the possibility of clairvoyance invariably prevailed. In order to better appreciate this point, it should be recognized that we all probably should have done the same if we had, rec if we had belonged to this earlier stage of psi investigation. It is always hard to recognize how much the cultural grip of a particular time tends to hold our thinking in fixed channels. In the instance of the early telepathy investigations, there is what now seems an amazing example of this channeling of thought by reason of its own determining purpose, one that continued over half century of critical and even heated discussion by some of the ablest scientists of the day. There eventually came a time, however, when opportunities that were denied to the earlier investigators opened the eyes of some of those who were working in parapsychology, and the fallacy was immediately obvious. This advantage fell to the Duke University investigators in 1930, and they recognized that all the work of the telepathy of experimenters up to that time could not safely be considered as evidence, either of telepathy or of clairvoyance, but rather of only an undifferentiated type of extrasensory perception. Thus, it will never be known whether the first half-century of evidence for telepathy was really produced by telepathy or by clairvoyance. At the Duke Laboratory, telepathy tests were designed with a view to excluding the possibility of clairvoyance, and at the same time, tests of clairvoyance were undertaken in which precautions were taken against telepathy. The, first few, the few experiments on clairvoyance that had been conducted did not involve an error comparable, comparable to that of the telepathy tests, so clairvoyance had a much more acceptable case than telepathy, in spite of the paucity of clairvoyance researches. At any rate, the hypotheses of telepathy and clairvoyance were both to be given full consideration. That much of a forward step was taken. As, it is, as is already known from the published reports, no great difference was found between the test scores obtained from the so-called pure telepathy tests and the tests of pure clairvoyance. In the pure telepathy tests, the sender had no card or object, but merely thought of a symbol, withholding the recording until the receiver had recorded his response. In the pure clairvoyance test, the experimenter did not know the card order until after the test was over. Both methods gave results that indicated something beyond the operation of chance. These results were taken to mean that both telepathy and clairvoyance actually occur, as of course had been suggested by the spontaneous experiences. Even when some comparisons were made with the old method of testing for telepathy, that is, the method of undifferentiated in extrasensory perception, which allows for telepathy and clairvoyance to function, there was no significant difference. Telepathy and clairvoyance operating together, or at least having the condition in which they could operate together, did not produce a higher scoring rate. This finding, along with other supporting evidence, led to the view that the same fundamental ability is involved in both the telepathy and clairvoyance tests. Otherwise, with two distinctive abilities functioning, the scores should have been higher, perhaps even twice as high, as with either one alone. Telepathy and clairvoyance were taken as most likely to be merely aspects of the same basic extrasensory perception, or ESP. It is, of course, easy now to see that if the original case studies had been taken more objectively, and, with, and the research suggestions drawn from the way in which ESP occurred spontaneously, and if theoretical bias and rational habit had been played down more, there would probably never have been a very big distinction made between the tele telepathic and clairvoyant types of cases in the first place. 
Moreover, in starting from the spontaneous case material, psi investigators may, not ha may have seen at once that the phenomena were not limited by time and space. But even though this important point was overlooked in early SPR studies, it should have been ca caught earlier caught later on at Duke when we redesigned the test for telepathy to exclude clairvoyance. However, it did not occur to us to rule out the chance for precognition to affect the results in our tests for clairvoyance and telepathy. It was certainly not that we did not know about spontaneous experiences of, of precognition. The books on that subject by J.W. Dunn, Dame Edith Littleton, H.F. Saltzmarch, and Charles Riche were well known. With all the spontaneous case material, we should not have needed to wait for experimental evidence of precognition before considering it as a counter-hypothesis. We should have recognized that in clairvoyance tests it was futile merely to keep the experimenter from looking at the target card until after the subject records his response. Precognition could allow contact with the future observation as well as with the present one. Likewise, in telepathy tests, it did no good to have the sender delay recording his choice of symbol until after the receiver recorded his response. But no one thought of these alternatives at the time, so deep were they all, we all settled in our intellectual ruts. As a matter of fact, on these more transcendent aspects of ESP, its apparent independence of space and time, the spontaneous material impressed us far too little, and we finally came around to the discovery largely over the hard course of experimental demonstration. The introduction of distance between the subject and the target object or person toward which ESP was directed did not seem to make a difference in the scoring rate, nor did the comparison of the scores in tests involving ESP of the present order of a concealed deck of cards with tests of the precognition of the card order at a specified future time. Similar work has been done by a number of investigators both in America and in Britain. In time, the fact emerged that in these tests, ESP showed no relation to space and time. How confining these ruts of habit can be may be seen from what followed upon the separation of telepathy and clairvoyance experimentally at the Duke Laboratory in the early 30s. Since we all more or less share in the responsibility for this situation, and all stand to profit from whatever lessons may be learned, I trust it will not be misunderstood if I attempt an analysis of some of these reactions. So strong were the, some, were the existing conventions on the case for telepathy that some of the ablest workers in parapsychology almost completely ignored the experimental findings on clairvoyance, even though it was not long before these findings far outweighed in scope and quality the experimental work that had been done with telepathy, both with the new pure telepathy method and with the old undifferentiated ESP experiments. It seemed, therefore, a serious omission when, in his book on telepathy, Carrington declined to consider clairvoyance in proposing a hypothesis on the nature of telepathy. In his experimental work, too, he continued to follow the old undiscriminating type of telepathy test, which allowed the possible operation of clairvoyance as well as of telepathy. Carrington's work will serve here merely to, to illustrate a group of researches. So forthright and rigorous a thinker as Carrington, however, was not content to merely ignore the evidence for clairvoyance. He set out to explain it as possibly just another form of telepathy. Given precognition, which was well on the way to establishment and telepathy, it was possible that the subject and the card-calling tests of clairvoyance merely went ahead to the time when the experimenter checked the cards against the subject's calls to determine the number of hits. In a word, he used precognitive telepathy to explain the results obtained in the clairvoyance test and considered that the hypothesis of clairvoyance was not necess a necessary one for the explanation of the extra chance results that were obtained. Thus ran Carrington's argument. It ran just as well, however, against the case for pure telepathy, when precognition was combined with clairvoyance as an alternative to telepathy. In fact, it worked even better. The challenge of Carrington's argument against the case for clairvoyance suggested the need to reconsider the general state of the findings on telepathy and clairvoyance in the light of the evidence for precognition. It became clear to me finally that it was a mistake to ignore precognition in designing our tests for pure telepathy and pure clairvoyance. It was immediately obvious that much of the research supporting pure clairvoyance was, as Carrington has suggested, subject to interpretation as precognitive telepathy. But when it came to the case for telepathy, there was no evidence at all left that could not also be dealt with on the theory of precognition and clairvoyance. It was no good at all against the clairvoyance hypothesis to hold off recording the sender's target until after this receiver had made his response. The timing was no safeguard.
Again, therefore, we had no unambiguous evidence for telepathy anywhere on record. We were back again at the beginning on the problem of telepathy. Even the spontaneous cases that had originally inspired interest in the subject could not be taken as evidence of telepathy, even if one wished to consider anecdotal material as worth using as evidence. In all these cases, as with all the experimental studies, precognitive clairvoyance could account for anything that had been obtained. There was, on the other hand, some evidence of clairvoyance that could not be interpreted in terms of precognitive telepathy. A number of experiments conducted at the Duke laboratory, as well as some of Tyrell's tests with his electrical machine, had furnished evidence that did not allow of the precognitive telepathy interpretation. The important fact that permitted this conclusion to be drawn was that the order of the cards, or, in the Tyrell experiment, the order of the target box selected, was never gone over again by the experimenter as it had been followed in the conduct of the tests. Consequently, there was no future to which the subject could go forward, no source of information in the mind of the experimenter at a later time on which precognitive telepathy could draw. The Duke experiments that excluded precognitive telepathy, telegraphy, were mainly of the type known as matching tests in which the cards are laid down opposite a set of key cards, and the order in which the cards are laid down is not preserved. They also included the type of test known as the ESP shuffle. One of the most carefully conducted series on record, the Pratt and Woodruff series, fell in this category of experiments that did not permit of the interpretation by precognitive telepathy, and accordingly, the case for clairvoyance stood up comparatively well under the reconsideration that was given to the whole of the evidence for extrasensory perception. I cannot emphasize too strongly, however, that whether or not an ESP experiment gave results that could be incontestably ascribed to telepathy or clairvoyance, it was nonetheless evidence of extrasensory perception of an undifferentiated type. The point is that the case for ESP was not in any way weakened by this internal upset over the problem of te telepathy, although the net result was that there was no evidence of telepathy at all that stood up against the reasonable counter-hypothesis of precognitive clairvoyance. At the close of a friendly and thoroughly stimulating debate over the relationship between telepathy, clairvoyance, and precognition, Dr. Tholis drew up a logical clarification of the possible interrelations and gave us all a chart that should have been in mind at the outset, but the situation as regards telepathy and the clairvoyance remained approximately as I had appraised it. Telepathic ESP was hypothetical. Clairvoyant ESP was established. As had naturally been hoped by everyone, the situation did not remain that way for long. Ms. McMahon of the Duke Laboratory set to work at once with an improved method for the testing of telepathy, one that was designed to meet the requirements for the exclusion of precognitive clairvoyance, and in the course of her experiment she obtained significant results that apparently could not be explained by any other method than telepathy. The method was necessarily more complex than had been used before. It required the avoidance of any kind of record of the order of target on which the sender had been thinking. The particular compl complication involved the method of coding by which an assistant could have access mentally to the order of symbols without leaving a, leaving a record available to precognitive clairvoyance. I will not review the details of this method here since it has already been established and published. Burge developed another method at Duke and obtained marginally significant results with it, but the really strikingly significant results on the new telepathy tests were obtained in England by Dr. Soule with Mrs. Stewart as the subject. So today we may say that the case for telepathy is reasonably secure so far as the alternative of precognitive clairvoyance of the symbol record is concerned. Another barrier to the establishment of telepathy had been surmounted. It is in order here to pause for brief consideration of one of the most exceptional features in the experimental work of Dr. Soule, with both of his two outstanding subjects, Basil Shackleton and Mrs. Stewart, Dr. Soule reports failure to get significant results when he excluded the possibility of telepathy and conducted the test on clairvoyant lines entirely. Even when the subject was unaware that the test was a clairvoyance test and had been led to think that it was a general ESP test, allowing for both telepathy and clairvoyance, the score was insignificant. These results set off against the considerable array of evidence for clairvoyance obtained by other experimenters with other subjects raised some questions. 
Without attempting to discuss all of the several possibilities, I would like to suggest that it might be a relationship here to what Dr. Schmeidler in City College of New York has been finding as regards attitude between the two classes of subjects whom she calls sheep and goats, those subjects whose attitude was favorable to clairvoyance and those who were unfavorable. She has found in repeated experiments that the subject's attitude can significantly influence success in the tests. And it is not impossible that subjects in Dr. Soul's experiments were sheep with regard to telepathy and goats on clairvoyance. Since they demonstrated ESP capacity of the order that they did, we must not suppose that any effort to keep them entirely ignorant of changes in the procedure would be absolutely successful. And yet if the conditions are changed so as to exclude telepathy without the subjects knowing it, we cannot count on his discovering this change and directing his ESP toward the card as the target. On the basis of what we know, therefore, I do not see how we can draw any conclusions about this interesting exception, except to say that it challenges further inquiry. The effect of the difficulties over telepathy has been a salutary one. I spoke of Thallus's analysis of the combinations of interrelations between the various psi capacities. Later, in conjunction with Wisner, he went further in analysis of the possible ways in which the evidence for telepathy, which we now have, might be interpreted. This analysis represents a third shakeup in the theorizing about telepathy, and it may be that it will take telepathy effectively out of the present experimental picture in parapsychology. Thelis and Wisner explain that what we have in the latest telepathy test results is not necessarily evidence of a mind-to-mind -mind transfer of thought. We may refer to it safely as a person-to-person -person transfer of thought impressions, but, as we shall see, that allows for a number of interpretations as to what actually takes place. Tholus and Wisner list four possibilities, the simplest being the original Myers concept of a direct mind-to-mind -mind transfer. The next is analogous to sensory communication, with the two minds communicating through their bodies. In the third type, the sender's mind somehow reaches and influences the body of the receiver directly, psychokinetically, and in the fourth, the receiver's mind may receive an effect direct extrasensorily from the sender's body. As the authors point out, the body-to-body -body transmission is excluded by the nature of the evidence, which appears to disregard space and time, and allows of no physical intermediation. Presumably, the body-to-body -body route of transmission would have to utilize physical energies related to the space-time system of the universe. As to the mind-to-mind -mind -mind interpretation of the evidence, Tholus and Wisner consider it to be the least likely, though still a possible explanation of this person-to-person -person transfer. Yet this mind-to-mind -mind conception of telepathy is the only one that truly represents the original use of the term. As Tholus and Wisner indicate, if the receiver obtains his impression from the body of the sender, from the nervous system, um, or from incipient response movements accompanying thought, etc., it is clairvoyant perception that is operating. Or if the sender impresses his thought on the receiver's organism by direct mental action, it is a psychokinetic effect. At any rate, whether or not we favor the mind-to-mind -mind interpretation of this person-to-person -person transfer of thought, we must agree that is, there is no way we can distinguish between these views experimentally, so far as we can see at present. To design that step may call for some knowledge that we have not yet acquired. If telepathy in the original sense of the word occurs, it looks as if it will have to wait a later stage of parapsychological development for its verification, a stage when we shall be able to say whether mind exists and functions in the independent way assumed in the older concept of telepathy. For the third time, then, we are back to the point of repeating what has become a refrain. We have nothing on the record that we can, without hesitation and ambiguity, call evidence of telepathy. And this time, the methodological difference has increased enormously, so that it is, for the present, insuperable. Perhaps the very challenge of the oft-repeated situation will sufficiently appeal to someone to call for a more exhaustive analysis than anyone has at yet been able to achieve, and no one can say, therefore, what there will be tomorrow in the way of proposals for a new method of investigating telepathy. For the present, however, and insofar as current research is concerned, the problem of telepathy, as distinct from undifferentiated ESP, may as well be laid on the research shelf. Whether it is justifiable to use the word telepathy to refer to person-to-person -person ESP is debatable. For popular discussions, it may be quite convenient to do so, but if such latitude be allowed, 
to the professional usage of terms, one might well wonder which is more important to the science, the terms themselves or the precision of their meaning. It seems best to call the effect in question extrasensory perception until we know more about it. Let telepathy remain the hypothetical phenomenon that Myers meant the word to describe. In that way, the question will be kept open, and it is important to keep it open as a clear-cut issue. But it is necessary, I think, to go a step beyond the Thalus and Wisner analysis and remind ourselves that there is no adequate ground even for supposing that the mind of either the receiver or the sender can interact directly with the body of the other. If this analysis of the history of telepathy and its study has been correct thus far, it is this assumption of a distinctly operating mind that must be especially watched in further thinking in parapsychology. For it is this very concept that is the major objective of the whole investigation of psi phenomena. The point was taken for granted by Myers because it was part of his philosophical heritage, but now we can raise questions that he could not be expected to have done in his time. The primary problem of parapsychology is to find out whether there is a division of personality operating distinctly on its own principles as a mind. It is only if and when that point is established that the concept of such a division, that the mind as a unit in its own right, can properly be used to obtain and explain the person-to-person -person transference of thought obtained experimentally. It may well be that the person can only act as a mind-body unit, even though the larger system possesses powers that the physical body alone does not, a sort of emergent set of powers that are still not sufficiently differentiable and separable as to deserve the designation of a mind. It is quite important, therefore, to the more refined scientific objective in parapsychology to question this assumption of a three-acting mind or a dis mind distinctive in its operations from the brain or body. If the fact be kept clear that the primary object of study is the nature of the psychophysical relation in personality, whatever it may turn out to be, there is less danger of making erroneous assumptions about the answer. To justify the use of the concept of mind in the sense used by Myers, it would be necessary to establish that within the living person some independent operation of a distinct part of the personality system occurs. That would, of course, if it were accomplished, at once lead us on to the further question as to how distinct the two parts are of each other, what independent actions the hypothetical mind could perform. The question of telepathy would follow as a matter of course, and there would be many others of similar magnitude and import. This review of the story of the telepathy research is, however, only half of the picture, and as it turns out, the less important half. What has happened in the clairvoyance experiments during the same period gives a wholly constructive turn to the account as a whole, and especially gives point to the lesson to be drawn from this survey of the work on telepathy. For the clairvoyance research taken alone has achieved such progress towards the goal of the founders of parapsychology as to cover all the setbacks in the researches on telepathy as originally conceived. The hypothesis of clairvoyance can be regarded as having already been established, and that this clairvoyant function is precognitive is also now experimentally verified. For the details of the argument regarding the adequacy of the evidence for clairvoyance and precognitive clairvoyance and a review of some of the evidence, the articles published in the Journal of Parapsychology in 1945 and 1946 should be consulted. It is wise to keep in mind, however, that the first major question of parapsychology does not depend on the differentiation of the types of ESP. It is, of course, much more easily seen today than earlier that there never was any need for concern over the discrimination between clairvoyance and telepathy in order to get at the main objective of the society's founders, a scientific answer to the question of whether personality has a division that transcends physical explanation. For this purpose, the important thing about the spontaneous cases that attracted interest is the fact that they suggest something in personal experience that seems to defy space and time. A spontaneous psychic experience may bring on an awareness of something that happened halfway around the world, or something that has not yet happened at all. Certainly one need not accept these cases as evidential. They may be taken as merely provocative, to justify the beginning of an inquiry to see whether these experiences represent something that is human and still not physical. They hint at the presence of something in personality that is spiritual in the sense of transcending material properties. All one needs to know, then, is whether the capacities can be experimentally verified to an adequate degree, and if so, whether the same transphysical properties suggested by the spontaneous cases are confirmed by the experiment. One does not need to ask at all whether this awareness is coming to the individual 
by way of another mind or by direct experience of a transcendent perception of the events themselves. The question concerns the way in which the person acquiring the knowledge operates, not in what is at the other end of the process of cognition. Is this perceptual act within the scope of physical law? If not, does it matter whether it is a case of telepathy or one of clairvoyance, insofar as the general question of parapsychology is concerned? There is no need to review the many experiments with ESP in which distance has been a condition. In some of these, long and short distances have been compared. In others, long distances were an incidental part of the experiment. It is now well known that no reliable relationship has been found between the results and the corresponding distances, which have extended as far as thousands of miles. There is, also, a fairly well-established case for precognitive ESP, although there has not been comparatively as much evidence on this aspect of physicality as on the spatial dimension. The experiments have not yet conclusively established the reach of precognition beyond a 12-day period, but there are indications that experiments in prediction over longer terms will be no less successful. It is at present an active area of investigation, and thus far there is no relationship found between the ESP scoring and time, any more than there has been between ESP and space. Probably no one supposes that there is complete independence of physical principle in these ESP activities. It is hard to think of interaction without some limiting principle that would affect the result at some order of refinement. The exploration thus far has had to be largely on an empirical basis, and it is necessarily necessary to leave the question entirely open as to how far this experience, this difference between the physical and non-physical functions of a personality extend. To discover how far it is possible to go in considering that man has a distinctive mental system that is non-physical is the objective of our future investigation. It may be found that these fragmentary phenomena of ESP and related capacities, which we are able to measure against the physical pattern of space and time, are only glimpses of a great world of extra-physical or spiritual reality, as hidden to us as the world hidden within the atom was a hundred years ago. Or, again, it may be that the distinctions between these non-physical and the more familiarly physical functions are only superficial ones, awaiting a clarification from a larger perspective to which we may be coming just a step or two ahead. It seems reasonably safe to say only that in the psi researches there is a sound basis that shows within the areas tested a remarkably consistent absence of any relation to the principles that identify the physical world for us in terms of time and space. If there are those who in this connection are afraid of words such as dualism and monism, there is a ready alleviant for both anxieties, even though these studies reveal a diversification in the personality that is profound enough to warrant a view of mind-body duality. They cannot destroy the unity concept of the person because there has to be, we infer, a degree of unification in interaction. On the other hand, no matter what the research of the future reveals regarding the basic integration of all personal, vital, and mechanical energetics of the universe, it will still not obliterate the experimentally de verified distinctions drawn between persons and things. These are not conflicting concepts, they are complementary. And parapsychology, therefore, need not be concerned, I think, except to avoid the unrecognized use of untested assumptions in the planning and interpreting of its researches. It may justly be claimed, however, that little as the contribution of the psi researches may seem to followers of faith and speculation, this is more evidence that than the world has ever yet been furnished hitherto in justification of the hypothesis of a world of personality transcending matter. If one is extremely cautious, he may incline to think that this meager imperial, empirical evidence we have found of diversification within the person may be all there is to find. It is reasonable to say, however, that for the simplest explanation of these findings themselves, there must surely be a great deal more yet to be discovered behind psi phenomena and their relation to space and time. Certainly a step has been made in the forward direction on the great problem with which to, which so interested Myers and other builders of society. In saying this, it is fitting to remember that without their contribution, however its value may stand in current re reappraisal, we should probably not be discussing the problem today, much less be able to make some sort of claim of advancement. It is not, however, only with the past that this discussion is chiefly concerned. What has been said thus far is intended partly as an introduction. 
Such a critical appraisal of past research can be cl best claim our attention if we can see how to turn it to the advantage of future research. With these lessons in mind, we can now consider with better understanding the other great question that interested our forerunners in this branch of science and has, whether for better or worse or not at all will agree, received more attention from the society and from the world than any other problem in the field of parapsychology. I refer, of course, to the problem of spirit survival. For the most part, the survival research consisted of the study of mediumship and, and occupied the main energies of many of the great leaders of our field during the earlier years. Yet although it enlisted in its support some of the ablest scientists of modern times, this investigation of mediumship in relation to survival has, beyond question, fallen far short of its mark. A case for survival has not been established to the satisfaction of any professional group, not even our own small group of parapsychologists, which is presumably the most favorably oriented one to be found. A hundred years or more of less scientific consideration of the survival question has left the scientific professions more unconvinced and more indifferent to the claims today as ever. During the last quarter of a century, both public and professional interest in the problem has declined to a very marked extent. One reason for this failure is to be found in the lack of methods of impartial appraisal of the statements made by the mediums. It is a curious fact that in so long a history of the study of mediumship by able professional men, so little effort was expended on setting up ways of eliminating bias in the judgment of free verbal material. Some of the early investigators were acutely conscious of the hazards of observation of seance room performances, but they seemed to have been much less aware of the equally great perils in the task of verifying and appraising mediumistic utterances. A second great barrier to the establishment of a conclusion on the survival issue lay in the confusion over what the alternatives really are. The question of how much could reasonably well be explained by telepathy was a recurrent one, but the corresponding possibility of the use of clairvoyant ability by the medium was not seriously considered. The great energies devoted to the investigation of the survival hypothesis were not turned, as it now seems they should have been from the first, towards a thorough study of the powers attributable to the medium's own personality. Consequently, there was no way of knowing what might have originated in the personalities of the discarnate so long as the range of the medium's own capacities was unknown. Here again, as in the research on telepathy, may be seen the determining influence of the intellectual bent in the climate of thought of the day. The worst disadvantage, however, from which the spirit hypothesis suffered in this investigation in the past was the fact that the issue was forced prematurely. The question of whether the spirit survives bodily death depends first on whether there is anything like a spirit in man at all, or whether the belief that there is stands entirely without foundation in fact. When we ask the survival question without first having settled this prior one, we are either making an unsupported assumption or else we are asking two questions at once and either way is notoriously a hazardous and unsatisfactory scientific approach. In general, the efforts that have been made to establish a case for spirit survival have been based on the belief in man's spiritual nature that is part of our cultural heritage. This traditional doctrine may be partially or even entirely correct, but it is not a sound and effective scientific procedure to start out with assumptions based on mere belief. So long as we are ignorant as to whether there is a distinctive spiritual component in the living individual, what sort of a subdivision it is, if there be one, how independent and possibly separable such an element may be within the total personality, and what its properties are, we cannot expect to be able to design a crucial experiment to test the hypothesis that such a spiritual portion of personality survives the destruction of the body, beginning, as the investigators of the spirit hypothesis did, with the cart before the horse, an impossible burden was placed upon their experimental program. It could not have succeeded short of the miraculous chance that their assumptions were entirely correct, and that there is a human spirit that is essentially all that was supposed by them to be. The research attempts on the spirit hypothesis were thus at a huge disadvantage. The hypothesis was loaded with traditions of theological and occult character to an extent that overburdened the slender framework of fact. Spirit, in a word, was a nebulous concept to work with. Reliable, confirmed knowledge about it was lacking, in spite of all that has been written about it. Add to this the fact that the hypothesis of spirit ran counter to the trends of biological and psychological thought of the last 200 years, 
and it is not hard to understand why the survival research has fallen far short of its goal. Only those who are philosophically inclined to accept the hypothesis and are at the same time not fully aware of the alternative interpretations of the evidence are led to accept it as established. Those who are indifferent or critical find the evidence not compelling and the reasoning far from con conclusive. It is true that a fair amount of progress has been made along incidental lines leading up towards the investigation of survival. On the first great need mentioned, a good deal of advance has been made. The development of objective methods of appraising the verbal material of mediumship began with Saltmarsh's efforts and the development of the sole Saltmarsh formula for establishing pr probability in such material. This method ha was much improved by Pratt's contribution in 1936 and has much been much further aided more recently by the Pratt and Burge technique. Although their method should be regarded as still needing further improvement, it serves to show with a fair degree of accuracy how much knowledge is displayed by a medium in a set of sitting records. Above all, the judgments and the appraisal in this method are quite objective. Likewise, too, there has been progress in the investigation of the capacities that may be credited to the medium's own personality. The invest investigations of what have come to be called psi abilities of the individual consisting of ESP and psychokinesis, PK, have at least carried the problem well beyond the point where the only alternative hypothesis considered was that of telepathy. There can now be added to the medium's endowment, in addition to her more familiar gifts, such as the capacity to impersonate, shrewd psychological insight, long practice with the kind of people who go to mediums, and perhaps an exceptional memory, a broad range of psi equipment with its wide reach over space and time and its capacity to interact with matter in some unknown degree and manner, both cognitively and kinetically. In the view of the more elaborate equipment of psi capacities, which must be allowed as the potential endowment of every medium, it is extremely difficult, if not at present impossible, to design an experiment for a crucial test of the survival hypothesis on the basis of present knowledge. No one, at least, has been able to think of a way to discriminate between the hypothesis of spirit agency and this omnibus type of counter-hypothesis which it has to meet, consisting of all the human abilities which could reasonably be accredited to the medium as an exceptionally gifted person. So far, all the experimental or semi-experimental demonstrations of mediumistic powers that are recorded under conditions that merit consideration can reasonably well be explained by a combination of powers attributed to the living. Evidence of survival cannot, of course, be accepted on scientific terms so long as there is a reasonable alternative explanation. Throughout all the investigations of spirit survival of the assumption, the assumption has been made, more or less tacitly, not only that man has a spirit, but that when a spirit person dies, his spirit acquires powers he did not have while living. Otherwise, he would not demonstrate his continuance as a personality through actions that could be not be ascribed to the impersonating agency of living persons, principally the medium, of course. Yet there has not been any clarification of this range of supposedly added powers such that an experimental study of it could be designed. In fact, there is no good ground for the assumption itself. It is pure speculation or is based on unverified mediumistic revelations. Obviously, if no one can propose a good research plan for a crucial test of the survival hypothesis, it will have to be laid on the parapsychological shelf along with the telepathy hypothesis, and both of them can be left for a time when a more strategic attack can be made on the problem. Something like this was proposed by Dr. G. N. M. Tyrell in his Myers Memorial Lecture on Apparitions. As in the case of telepathy, however, this is not a negative step, and it does not imply rejection or, in fact, a final judgment of any kind. It is, in point of fact, the best strategy for the investigation of the survival hypothesis itself. If now attention can be turned to the primary question of psi research, namely, whether there is an immaterial part of human personality, a spiritual self that might conceivably be considered capable of survival, the answer to that which will put us well on the way to the answering of the question of survival itself. If the continued investigation on this first question shows that, in these extra-physical psi capacities which we have already been studying, we are dealing with powers that function only as interactions of the body and mind as an individual spirit, there would be no point in further raising the question of the hypothesis of spirit agency. 
if there develop no indications of a distinctive unit in human personality capable of separate operation from the sensory motor system of the individual, the survival question will not be likely to be actively raised again. If, on the other hand, the research goes on to find behind these ESP effects an elaborate extra-physical system of mental operations, and the manifestations of these operations can be drawn further and further away from close physical association with the nervous system, there will come a point where the logical next step will be to focus experimental attention on the degree of separability and on the possibility of complete and independent existence of this hypothetical subdivision of personality that would conform to the conception of a spirit. The point to emphasize now is that these researches on the question of whether or not there is a spiritual unit in the personality should give us the information we will have to have before we can plan a crucial test of the survival hypothesis. It is, however, no mere logical technicality that says it is necessary to know whether there is a spirit in man before there can be a proper question whether that spirit survives death. The point is rather that we must know whether there is a distinct spirit in the human makeup and know what such a spirit actually is like and what it does before we can intelligently design a suitable, suitable test for it in the discarnate condition. We have to know what we can expect it to do under such and such circumstances. We cannot begin with mere beliefs as to what spirit behavior is. It is probably because past efforts to investigate survival were made on suppositions about the nature of spirits that are highly speculative and, would, and probably fantastic that the efforts failed to prove anything conclusive one way or the other. Such a position will not be agreeable to those who have already been convinced of spirit survival, but it will be no more welcome to those who have considered that spirit survival is a ridiculous hypothesis. But perhaps everyone, no matter what no matter what nor how extreme his position, will recognize that for most of the critical thinkers in the world, it will be highly important to find out, on the basis of incontestable evidence, just what the post-mortem destiny of personality really is. In any case, however, it is highly probable that there will be no resumption of survival research on the old lines any more than there will be with old-style telepathy tests. If these lessons of the past mean anything, the inquirer of the future will henceforth steer clear of entangling theologies and speculative hypotheses and plan a straightforward and thoroughgoing investigation of just what the distinction really already found between the non-physical and physical operations in personality means and what more can be made of it in the understanding of the nature of the individual. With sufficient success in this exploration, the parapsychologist will find out what we all want to know, just how much of a differentiated mind or soul or spirit there is in man, and if there is any, what its powers and properties are. To those with whole, whose whole interest in parapsychology may have been tied up with telepathy and survival, these remarks will appear depressing, but they are far from being as negative as they may first appear. Rather, the explorers in this beginning science are finally getting out of the blind alleys which their predecessors have been wandering about much too fruitlessly during the last, last half century and more. Indeed, this escape from the intellectual traps in which so many inquirers have been caught might almost be hailed as a com coming of age of this new branch of science. Now, for one thing, the student of parapsychology may be more clear about what the objectives of the science are. The speculative associations and cultural trappings that have been carried along with our branch of inquiry all too long are being cast off. Now the problems can be dealt with for what they are worth, independent of anyone's belief about them, and regardless of current trends of interest or philosophical bias. The problems are urgent, the methods are ready, and not a few of the other requisites of a science are at hand. Given time and a wise use of opportunities, parapsychology will emerge as a full-bodied and effective science, playing a significant role on the stage of human thought. The outlook is not at all depressing. In summary, it can be seen that in general terms, parapsychology has gone wrong in the past mainly in stating its problems in terms of untested assumptions that were part of the current thought of the period. Spontaneous thought transference was bound up with the traditional concept of the mind as a distinct operating unit of personality, and the main significance of psi phenomena for the nature of personality was thus seriously confused. The claim of spirit communication was taken over as a problem along with the traditional assumptions of a spirit in man and of what a spirit is like. 
In both these main researches of the earlier period of parapsychology, a more effective order of investigation would have inquired first into the assumptions rather than take them for granted. It is clear, however, that the principal line of advance of the psi researches has been heading straight towards the main goal of parapsychology. The experimental work with psi abilities has shown that these are transphysical functions in man and that they have their lawful place in the total personality of the individual. This finding, then, is the forward base of operations for parapsychology in its search for the outlines and boundaries of the proper domain to which this psi functioning belongs. By working out from and expanding the already verified principles, the explorer can follow the safest and most productive line of advance. These established findings do indeed open up a wide front for further inquiry, challenging enough in the outlook given. For example, the discovery of precognition only raises more questions as to the way it works and the extent of its operation. It is not known how much of the future is, is cognizable, and how much precognition fits in with volition volitional freedom is a profound mystery indeed. How, in fact, precognition can conform to our concept of causation itself is a problem that may baffle us for many a year. Only by further research can we answer these questions, and they are questions on which the answers are, can hardly be anything but revolutionary, both to science and society. What, in general, the full significance of psi for mankind will be must depend greatly on how far the researches will get in bringing it under conscious control or making it reliable in some other way. Enough promising leads have already been received to encourage work towards this objective. It is, however, by no means only a question of practical utilization of psi that is involved in the production and problem of conscious control. Rather, the establishment of the possibility or impossibility of getting ESP into consciousness would tell a great deal about the process itself and about its implications. This last point may be seen by considering what would follow if ESP turned out to be irrevocably conscious, unconscious. Among other implications of great interest, is the consequence that this point would have for a theory of survival. Spirit communication, which presumably would have to be extrasensory, would then be necessarily unconscious. Still another inviting frontier of inquiry concerns the place of psi in the biological picture. We must suppose that psi capacity will be found to have a hereditary basis, an evolutionary origin, and possibly some degree of localization of function in the organism. There may be many other rightful claims to biological relationship that psi should be expected to have. There are certain patterns of evidence and suggestion that point somewhat toward a lower and remote evolutionary origin for psi capacity. These indications would take too much space to review here. Some of them, however, are good enough to deserve more study of psi in animals. In fact, a large survey of incidental phenomena suggesting animal psi is urgently needed, along with experimental study in certain species as well. The interest here is not, of course, primarily biological. Rather, the place psi finds in the system of living things will tell us a great deal about its basic character and its significance for man. Whether it should turn out to be a vestigial function or one that is merely latent, obscured under a development of higher intellectual powers, would make a great deal of difference not only practically as to what could be done with psi development, but theoretically with regard to its role in the mental life of the person. If psi is merely obscured, it may be playing an important part in the normal and an abnormal life of man, even in the directional forces of this organism concerned with health and disease, and conceivably, though more remotely, with growth and life itself. We already know enough about the psychosomatic system of the person to realize that psi may be possible may possibly be extremely important here. Nothing except careful research, however, can answer any of those questions. An adequate study of the personality correlates of psi capacity should presumably bring its place in the larger organization of the individual into the clear. It has been a most fruitful line of research, largely through the work of Stewart, Schmeidler, and Humphrey. Already the point was becoming clear, however, that most of the species deal not with the real correlation with psi itself, but with the inhibitory personality states with which it has to cope. Thus the correlation found many deal, may deal in great part only with the question of how good a test subject a person is, not necessarily with, that, with how much psi ability he might be capable of demonstrating.
the point does not at all lower the value of the personality research, but it does bring out the greater profundity of the problem. ESP itself is harder to get at than was recognized. Probably no research program is, is safe that does not keep close to the original sources that set its problems. Parapsychology arose out of spontaneous psi experiences. Without that, there would almost certainly never have been any experiments on the subject. The unfortunate attempt of early students of the field to give case material conclusive evidential value led to a reaction against it that cut off the interest in it that experimentalists might otherwise have maintained. There is no reason, however, why there should, be or should not be a restoration of the spontaneous case report to its proper place in the scheme of the research. From these natural experiences of psi capacity, or at least what appears to be psi capacity, there is no need to be certain. It may be possible to get suggestions as to what psi is like that would never come out under the conditions of the laboratory. These suggestions can then be tested experimentally if the case studies give sufficient status to justify this effort. A research can always disprove an unsound hypothesis, but it can do nothing but stagnate it if it suffers from a dearth of good ideas to test. And until all the recurrent case phenomena have been put on trial, it will assuredly pay for parapsychology to keep in close touch with its raw materials. If it remains too aloof from its natural phenomena, a laboratory research program could easily become sterile. The good to be derived from the spontaneous case material is not only in the suggestions as to what to investigate. We may also obtain better clues as to how to make a more successful attack upon some of our program problems. It is worth asking, for example, whether the early psi workers might not have obtained better guiding suggestions as to how to investigate the survival problem from spontaneous experiences than they got from the mediumistic practices of spiritualism. The case material has a fair number of instances that suggest the hypothesis of spirit agency, but they would not logically lead to the kind of experimental approach that grew out of the seance room developments. If and when survival research is planned in the future, these spontaneous reports should play an important part. This is not to say that parapsychology should ignore the claims and activities of such groups as the spiritualists or theosophists, or, for that matter, any organization that might conceivably be culturally phenomena of parapsychical nature. It is possible that the atmosphere and ideology associated with such group activities and their doctrines may foster the development of psychic capacities to a degree that it cannot otherwise be found. The same may be said, of course, for other social cultures and peoples, especially non-literate or less sophisticated societies where possible psi practices may have been more freely encouraged. Already, parapsychology has profited by keeping an eye on the pages of social anthropology, and this perspective should be broadened rather than narrowed in the future. While it is necessary to be more guarded wherever there are doctrines involved, and these are likely to adulterate any natural expression of psi phenomena, we cannot afford to overlook any clues that might help us with our baffling problems. This type of naturalistic empirical approach has proved safest and most fruitful for science in general. The focus is kept always on the need to explain in more familiar principles a given puzzling occurrence encountered in nature. If it does not wholly lend itself to such explanation, new and unfamiliar principles are sought and formulated. In the area of problems with which we deal in parapsychology, it looks as if we shall have to be prepared for some new formulations, but this aspect only adds to the appeal with its promise of an enrichment of our knowledge of man in relation to his universe. Using the longer retrospect we have today, we can see that in studying further the extent of the independence of psi from the material order, and in keeping what we can of the peculiar nature of these most definitely non-physical characteristics, we will best serve the large purpose which we honor in the, the founders of parapsychology. Whatever of mind or spirit emerges from the researchers ahead, and whatever transcendent powers and properties may be discovered, will be arrived at by routes which can be described and retraced sufficiently for the demands of a pioneer science. Knowing then where we stand, with the security which scientific method can alone can, improve, can provide, we can plan further large research ventures with a basis of knowledge denied to those who, for example, boldly attacked the survival problem when spiritualism's tidal wave quashed it ashore a century ago. 
But it is not only in the firmer realism of scientific procedures that we must ground our studies if we wish them to be soundly productive and useful. Perhaps equally important is the need to follow or even lead the sciences of today in their trend towards a fuller adaptation to the social needs and outlook of their time. If I know anything of the creators of this branch of study, theirs was never a cloistered interest, not at all a mere academically detached pursuit of knowledge for knowledge's sake. But followers in every discipline find it easier to catch and keep the products of a leader's vision than the creative vision itself. Myers saw the significance of psychical research primarily in relation to religion and its adoptive, adopted child ethics. He and its, his generation had felt the destructive force of materialism most keenly in those areas of human relations. Were he alive today, he would see the devastating influence of a psychic, psychicalistic religion. Physicalistic religion view of man has affected more of our social institutions than religion. To take the example that is most arresting as I write these words, I will call attention to the fact that materialism seems to be the most fundamental principle of the philosophy of Russian communism today. The Soviet system is attempting to build a society on a theory of man as matter. It is especially significant, I think, that Western society, with all its various attacks upon the communist system, has not seriously assailed this basic premise. It is, not a, is it not a fact that until it utilizes the findings of parapsychology, it has little with which to attack the materialistic state philosophy of the USSR? If we have, as of course we have long since concluded we do have, scientific refutation of materialism that stands the severest critical analysis, on what justification should we hold aloof from the needs of our times with these vital and relevant findings? I can think of none but a misguided reticence born of a scholastic habit of thought. The world is today facing what may be its greatest crisis, largely because we have not socially and civically faced up to the menace of our, uh, to our value system growing out of the overtowering domination of modern life by the philosophy of matter. Freedom, morality, democracy, and a long list of values are, we know, tied in some way to our conception of man's relation to matter. A more lively realization of this relationship should give our studies an importance, a socially practical importance, that should bring gener generously to their aid all the assistance they have so long needed. But only a resolute and realistic effort can overcome the traditional disinclination to bring science to the aid of our value system. Whether in religion or politics, men turn to look for facts most reluctantly. There should be no need to argue, I think, that any area of service or application centering upon the nature of human personality must in time be profoundly affected by the outcome of the psi researches, past, present, and future. If this is too large a claim, then I have grossly misunderstood the nature of our field and its significance. If it is essentially correct, then the world has gravely misconceived the character of our work and its meaning. I believe the latter alternative is the true one. If so, it is time, if indeed there is yet time, that we recognize it. There is another relevant point. Our branch of inquiry has been going on long enough to have made a case for itself and earned a better share of the world's research resources and opportunities than it has received. The earlier assistance provided came largely out of interest in spirit survival. This source of support has been a declining one, with no supplanting area of interest taking its place in the mind of the public on which research on psi problems has always thus far depended. It is necessary then to the research itself that its vital importance to a wider range of problems of the human scene be made clear and convincing. If this topic appears too material and mundane on which to end this survey, let me justify it as a corrective to the overemphasis of an unrealistic subjectivity that too much surrounds our field. It is a positively shocking fact, if our problems are one-tenth as important to humanity as we conceive them to be, that there is only a single little laboratory in all this wealthy and research-saturated world in which even a handful of full-time investigators can devote their attention to these questions. Either human personality has fallen too low in value to matter, or else the sound foundation and broad potential of parapsychology have simply not yet been understood. Surely the latter alone can be true. If so, our course and our responsibility are manifest, but it will be a new course and a new responsibility. 
Now, if you've gotten this far, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Thanks a bunch for hanging with me through this video. And if you would consider subscribing, if you haven't yet, I would really appreciate it. If you take a look down in the description. There should be a link to um, a coffee for um, basically raising funds for keeping this channel going and kind of just keeping me afloat. It would really be appreciated if um, you help the channel out. Um, anything that you do helps uh, keep me going and that also helps me get new resources to read out here, uh, new things to share with you, and just generally helps me make this channel a more fun place to be. So your support is appreciated. And um, now I'm going to read the rest of this. There is a little bit of material on the back, as well as a bit of information about supplemental lectures. I thought that might be interesting to wrap that up with. So thanks again. And here we go. Some SPR publications. Proceedings. In the Proceedings of the Society for Psychical Research are published full reports of major pieces of research, articles of an analytical or theoretical nature, presidential addresses, and some of the papers read at meetings of the Society. The proceedings are published in parts at prices from one shilling, six dollars, to eighteen shillings per part. A full list of all parts published since 1882 with contents and prices may be obtained gratis on application. Slight note from the reader, I'm not sure if I read out those prices correctly. End note. Journal. After 65 years of private circulation, the journal of the SPR was made available to the public in September 1949. It is published six times a year and contains reports of cases and experiments, special articles, the texts or summaries of some of the papers read at meetings of the society, reviews of books and periodicals, correspondence, etc. Published in January, March, May, etc. Annual subscription, 12 shillings, 6d. Per copy, 2 shillings. The Society for Psychical Research by G. N. M. Tyrell what it is, what it has accomplished, and why its work is important. Telepathy and Allied Phenomena by Rosalind Haywood with a section on quantitative experiments by S.G. Soul. Psychical Research, a Selective Guide to Publications in English, 1949. Transmediumship, an Introductory Study of Mrs. Piper and Mrs. Leonard by W.H. Salter. The Society for Psychical Research, an Outline of its History, by W. H. Salter, obtainable from the Society for Psychical Research, 31 Tavistock Square, London, W. C. 1. Supplementary lectures included in the front material. The Frederick W. H. Myers Memorial Lectures, 1929, Sir Oliver Lodge, Conviction of Survival, out of print. 1931, T. W. Mitchell, Beneath the Threshold, one shilling. 1933, Eugene Osti, Supernormal Aspects of Energy and Matter, out of print. 1935, W. Waitley Carrington, The Meaning of Survival, one shilling. 1937, C. A. Mage, Supernormal Faculty and the Structure of the Mind, one shilling. 1940, W. R. Matthews, Psychical Research and Theology, two shillings. 1942, G. N. M. Tyrell, Apparitions, out of print. 1945, Helen de G. Salter, Psychical Research, Where Do We Stand? One Shilling. 1947, S.G. Soul, The Experimental Situation in Psychical Research, Two Shillings. Thanks very much for hanging around and listening, and have a lovely evening.